All right. Well, um, to be honest, just can't do it. I can't preach about this gospel today without getting into uh, current events or politics. And no one here wants that. So instead, we're going to focus on the second reading. Pretty straightforward. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal, covet, or commit murder. (laughs) Pretty straightforward stuff. Do not commit evil to your neighbor. Because we all do this. We all do this to each other at some point. When we commit sin, we are somehow doing damage to ourselves or others. And we all do damage to each other at some point in our lives. It is inevitable. It's, it's human nature, original sin in all of that. So we do need to take sin seriously. And uh, we should never stop caring. We should never stop trying to do as little damage to each other as possible. But still, the question remains, what are we supposed to do to cope with our sinfulness? How are we supposed to deal with the reality that we do damage to one another, at least from time to time? So on that note, I have some 1,600-year-old advice for you. It's old, but it is not obsolete. It comes by way of St. John Chrysostom, and all I'm really doing is clarifying and updating the language a little bit. Basically, St. John Chrysostom says that there are five things we can do to cope with our sins in addition to the sacrament of confession. That obviously is a, uh, the first thing we should go to. So the first of these five things is actually so obvious, it's hard for some people to appreciate. The first thing we can do to deal with our sin is to honestly look and recognize the sin for what it is. Even if you do nothing else, at least you can say, Oh Lord, I know what I did was wrong. I regret what happened. Because even then, even though you're not repairing the damage in any way, at least you're being honest with God and with yourself. That goes a long way. Uh, I was watching a fairly boring movie a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was about a father and his two sons taking care of family issues. And the older son Uh, His wife just had a baby. She was actually still in the hospital during the beginning of the movie. So he flies back home to deal with the plot of the movie. And throughout the movie, he is constantly lying to his wife. Lying about meetings he's in that he's not really in. Uh, He says, oh, yeah, 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 honey, I'll be home at this time or whatever. And he doesn't. He actually at one point says, yes, honey, I'm on the way to the airport right now. And he still stays in town for two days. Um, And... He visits the next girlfriend while he happens to be home. (laughs) So at one point, the younger brother, who uh, who's still in high school, he says, "You know, if I had a woman like Lisa in my life, I would never lie to her." And the older brother just goes, "Good luck with that." And that is exactly what St. John Chrysostom is kind of alluding to. That older brother cannot possibly be forgiven his sins, at least at that point in the story, because he's choosing to remain in his sin. He doesn't understand how cruel he's being to his wife. You can't fix a problem until you admit that there is a problem in the first place. So once again, first thing we can do about sin is be honest about it. Second thing we do is also obvious, forgiving other people their sins against us. I know that's tough, but it's important. Because if you fixate on the wrongs of the past and you refuse to let it go, (laughs) 
that stuff will eat you alive. Absolutely. All of us here today has, have been a, we have all been a victim at some point in our past. Get over it. I, I don't say that to be disrespectful. I know some people have gone through some pretty heavy stuff. I'm not trivializing whatever it is you went through in the past. But I am urging you for your own good, you got to get over it. Because if you refuse to do that, if you refuse to let it go, you spend your entire life assuming that this person owes you something because of what happened in the past, you will rot away from the inside out. And other people will refuse to forgive you when the tables are turned, as they always do. So it's this never-ending cycle of anger and resentment. I don't recommend that. I don't wish that for any of you. And there is so much of that in the world. Just a few days ago, a friend of mine, I uh, haven't seen her for 10 years, she lives out of state, but uh, she has a very annoying neighbor, um, and she, she posted a very long rant on Facebook about what a terrible neighbor this is. But her neighbor is also on Facebook. So she responds about how bad my friend is as a neighbor, and so on and so forth, back and forth. Like 30 comments on Facebook, just these two people going at it. And if you're like me and just kind of looking at that as a third party, it's as clear as day that that's not solving anything. If anything, it's making it worse. That's what life looks like when there is no forgiveness in your heart. It's just a never-ending cycle of Facebook complaints. We can do better. So those are the two obvious things. That is the black and white answer about how to prepare and deal with sin. But what if that doesn't work? Because we all know that forgiving ourselves and other people can be hard. Sometimes it takes years. Once in a while, it takes a lifetime to forgive someone. What are we supposed to do in the meantime? St. John Chrysostom, he's got three more tools for us for exactly that reason. Number three of five is prayer. And I mean prayer for other people, not just for your own needs. Although there's nothing wrong with praying about yourself. When you pray for other people who have it worse than you, that increases your sense of compassion. And that is a very good remedy against sin. So prayer is always helpful, no matter what. The fourth thing we can do to cope with sin is almsgiving, a.k.a. generosity. Because if you cannot repair the damage you did to this one person, there is nothing stopping you from showing kindness and alleviating the suffering of another person. If you feel bad about yourself, reach out to the poor and the needy. You will feel better on the drive home. If you feel guilty about something that happened at work, you can always bring donuts into the office. And I admit that doesn't directly solve the problem, unless, of course, your sin is stealing donuts. It still counts. Because that act of bringing in donuts is an expression of your desire for redemption, absolution, and forgiveness. That matters. And finally, we have number five. You're not very likely to guess this one. The final way St. John Chrysostom tells us to cope with sin is simply to live a modest and humble life. Seriously, he writes that. <laughs> be good and don't be greedy or demanding. Be grateful for what you have and for the blessings in your life. Because when you get down to it, merciful and forgiving people are generally not the sort of folks 
that need a new car every year. They're grateful for what they have, and they tend to be forgiving people because they're not fixating on what other people have, and they don't fixate on what other people do. It's certainly an interesting thought, one we probably don't think about very much. So in conclusion, you can think of forgiveness as a kind of spiritual freedom. So what sets you free? Basically five things. Be honest with yourself. Set other people free from your anger and resentment. Pray as an expression of compassion. Alms give as an expression of generosity and lead a good life of humility and gratitude. And if you do those five things, sin will never enslave you for long.